So welcome everyone to the July Birmingham AWS meetup. Uh, we are now about uh, five or six months deep into these and uh, regular attendance has been great. So thank you all for bearing with us through the virtual sessions in COVID. It's actually, we were just talking before the start, it's actually been terrific because AWS have been very generous with their time and a lot of their team to dial in virtually and uh, participate and give us a lot of really great content and and input uh, that typically might have might not have been as as easy given you know, travel to do in person meetups. So a few things for this uh, few announcements uh, you may have seen over the last few weeks. Uh, we've been promoting the the BHM AWS website, a uh, great place to go. Uh, resources, anything related to the local meetup. We also post our advanced schedule of events there. Right now, we're booked through the end of the year. Also, please uh, follow us on LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, LinkedIn, also a lot of our a lot of our announcements come through there, and we post all of our video content and recaps of sessions on YouTube. So we hope that you'll check that out, share it, and follow us on those. Upcoming events, uh, next month, August 27th, Corey Harris Jr. will be back for the third in his series with Data Lakes, this time focusing on AI and machine learning tools in AWS. And September, we've got a load balancing and auto scaling presentation. October 29th, we have first for us, we're gonna conduct a panel conversation with some cloud security leaders from around the area. Uh, we're pulling that roster together now, hope to announce that finalized in the next couple of weeks, but that's gonna be a great, um, great opportunity for everybody to interact with some of our heavier security organizations around Birmingham and how they're implementing AWS and some, uh, some good chat back and forth on concepts and challenges with that. And last but not least, November 19th, Mr. Chapman, who's presenting today, will be back with us again to sort of build on uh, the content and uh, the topics that he presents today. 2021, we're booked through the end of the year. We are working now on the early part of 2021 to keep our topics and conversations going. So anyone in the local community, uh, we would love uh, to have some local presenters mixed in with this also. If you've got, if you or yourself or anyone you know would be interesting in presenting, we'd love to hear from you. Similarly, if any requests for topics, things that uh, the community wants to hear about, uh, we'd be happy to try to pull together some good content on that. So send any requests or suggestions to bhmaws at gmail.com and we will definitely be happy to follow up on those. Stickers. So we've got our Birmingham AWS stickers. We sent a batch of those out to attendees of last month's meeting. I uh, hope everybody got those by now. Anybody who wants them today, send a message uh, to myself or Justin with a mailing address and we will get those out in the mail in a few days to you. Um, once you've got your stickers, post a, uh, Post a photo on LinkedIn, tag it BHM AWS. Anybody who does that, we're gonna do a drawing for Uber Eats gift cards on August 15th. So just a little bit of fun to have with those, those stickers. All right, that's it. Uh, Chris Chapman is on deck, AWS Partner Solutions Architect. Wanna thank him for putting this demonstration together today and for joining us to um, to do this. We think it's going to be a great topic. Uh, we've also got Taylor Anderson here from the Elastic Beanstalk team at, at AWS Senior Project, uh, Senior Product Manager, uh, who'll be joining along with Chris for some Q&A at the end of today's topic. So with that, I will hand it over to Chris. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you for, uh, for the intro and everything. Um, uh, we've got a, we're going to be working through a DevOps pipeline here for windows workloads. So we're going to be checking in, uh, just the, I just grabbed the sample.net application. Uh, we're going to be checking that in. We're going to see that get deployed to, uh, an elastic beanstalk, which has some auto scaling and load balancing built into it. So this is a real good way. Maybe if you're migrating some of your workloads from on-prem to AWS, you don't want to go full containers or serverless yet. 
but you don't want to do just that lift and shift where you're doing just EC2 instances. You want to have some of that scalability built into it. Uh, this is a, a great platform to do that on. And then the other uh, big part of this will be service catalog, which is a way to uh, not only provide these tools to people so that they can provision on demand, but it's going to uh, give you that replicatability throughout your, uh, all your teams. So you can standardize the process, you can build in the security, the logging, uh, all of the pieces that are important to you, your cloud center of excellence and your security team, you have all that baked right in. You hand that off to the users and you're going to see how easy it is to, uh, to get this stuff up and running for your end users. So we're gonna start off today. Uh, one of the, the first orders of business we gotta do is um, we gotta get, uh, if, if you wanna follow along with me, I have a number of accounts. Uh, they're free accounts, they're just burners. They'll be online for a couple hours so we can do this. Uh, so if you wanna actually do this with me, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. I'm gonna, here in a minute, I'm gonna cut my um, video and we're gonna sh uh, screen share and you can follow along with me if you don't wanna do it and just see how it all works or uh, raise your hand and we'll start passing out these uh, accounts. The done a few of these virtual things and I, I think the best way to do this is to do it one at a time. So I'm gonna post a link and then I want someone to click on that link and start logging into the console. And But first, uh, just reply. So if you can open up the chat, you'll see that chat window there. I've got a link. If someone will just say, hey, I got it, and then I'll post the next one. And that way we don't get, um, we don't get confused and we've got uh, links coming out to people. So if you want, and I'll just keep doing that until everybody that wants to do this uh, has a link. There we go. Yeah, and I'll say while I'm doing this, uh, we're gonna have to move kind of fast through some of this and there will be a bit of dead time while uh, some of the build containers are coming online and some other stuff. So we want to we want to be able to get through to the parts where we can pause and then we can go back. We can talk about the uh, cloud formation and whatnot during that those dead times while we've got some uh, compute going on on the build process or just spinning up like the elastic uh, beanstalk environment. Uh, does someone want that next link? This will be easy if only one person wants to follow along. <laughs> okay, there's one more. All right, here comes number three. Yeah, I've got plenty of these, so don't, yeah, if you want to follow along. If not, that's also fine. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started then. It uh, looks like we got a couple people wanna follow along and most people are just going to, uh, to watch here. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, one more link. So if you're following along or if you're not, um, this, uh, all of the content for this lab will be right in there. So we wanna click on that. I'm gonna turn off my video and share my screen. Okay, so if you follow that link, we've got a reference architecture here. There's a subsection called Elastic Beanstalk. And what you want to do is make sure you, you've signed into your, uh, make, make sure you've signed into that, oh, sorry, I'm messing with my mic here. Uh, let's sign into that um, uh, link that I just sent you if you're following along. Uh, let's double check that you're not in your own account. The uh, AWS console is really good at tossing you back to where you were. In this particular case, we wanna make sure we're in that, uh, that uh, event engine account, which you should see up here at the top where my mouse is, this team role slash master key and then you know some, some stuff. So just double check that you're there and you're not in your account or your, your company's account if you've been signed in uh, before. Uh, and that'll just take you to the console here. Um, I happen to be in cloud formation right now, but okay. So what we want to do is we want to then go over to this, uh, the reference architecture. We're going to right click and we're going to open in a new tab on this launch stack button. Hopefully you see that. And this is going to take all of these uh, cloud formation templates. It's going to build a service catalog environment for us in this account. Okay. 
Uh, most of this you can leave under launch role, or sorry, linked role one. We want linked role one. I've just highlighted it here. We're going to do team role, which again is this uh, role that you get automatically logged in as um, if you're using the event engine. So we're going to put team role into this linked role one and then leave everything else alone. And we're just going to hit next. We're going to hit next again. There's some blue check boxes down here. We want to make sure we get those uh, checked. And then we're going to create the stack. So then we're in the, uh, now we're in the CloudFormation console. And this is where uh, all of our infrastructure as code is concentrated. So CloudFormation, uh, if you're not familiar with AWS or, or how, how all this works, CloudFormation is our templating language. And we are now launching templates into our AWS account. It's going to build out a couple things. You're going to see some uh, nested stacks popping in here. And again, all of this is back here on this reference architecture. We're just launching all of these templates into our account here. Uh, and it's going to create a service catalog uh, portfolio with a couple products and then uh, some launch constraints. So with service catalog, it is really, it's another front end for uh, cloud formation. And the advantage here is that you have users and you want to give them immutable predefined uh, templates. Again, with all that, uh, with all that security and everything baked in. So that way your users are, not only are they already, by using those templates, they're, not, they're, they're already using uh, how you want things to run in infrastructure as code and, and the templating, you're giving them all that ahead of time. But the other thing that Service Catalog does is it really creates a permissions firewall between your end users and these elevated permissions required to do things. So we're gonna be doing a lot of stuff in here. We're gonna be creating VPCs and S3 buckets and EC2 instances. So that's a pretty expansive list of permissions, but the end user will never have direct access to that. The end user is given access to service catalog and then service catalog is granted access to those roles and permissions. So there's no, there's no elevation of permissions. There's no assuming roles. We've really got just a nice clean designation. Here's the permissions that service catalog needs to do this. And then I give my end users access to service catalog. The other advantage here is that we can really narrow down the required information for our users. A lot of times we, we talk about building things for data scientists or developers, and some of those people may not even know what a VPC is or an availability zone, which one do I choose? So really when we're building templates for service catalog, I like to say we're architecting with the end user in mind, and we're trying to make it as simple as possible for them to do this while also providing all of the security and logging and, and um, best practices in the template. So they don't need to just click around in the console and figure this out. So at this point, I think I've talked long enough. We've got all of our uh, stacks are green here and you can, you can see there's a number of things. We've got our products. I'm gonna switch over to service catalog now. So if you go up to the, the top there in services, start typing catalog, it will take us over to service catalog. Now for this particular demonstration, we are both the administrator and the end user. Uh, normally there would be a, uh, a, a, you know, you would have the, you would be one or the other. Uh, very rarely would you be both. Although we do have customers that use Service Catalog for their administrative tools, just because it's so much easier to, to spin up large uh, collections of resources at the same time. So it, it's going to initially dump us into this administration view. We want to go in and, and we're going to put our end user hat on and we're going to be maybe a development lead. We've got a new project coming online. We need to get an MVC uh, .NET application up and running on a scalable Windows 2019 server. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to do now. So at this point, we want to get this top products, the very top one, make sure you're not under the administration. Uh, what happened here? Man. Uh, 
I am missing some products here somehow. Okay. I think the console just didn't load up for me there. Let's go back to products. <laughs> now this is going to be good, huh? Ah. Okay. Yeah, give me a second. I'm going to I'm going to switch out of here and go to my backup. Sorry about that. I'm going to pull up this backup option here. Screen one. Okay, I should be back in here. Just switched over to a, uh, a different account here. So pardon me while we got to relaunch those stacks. So I'm waiting for that to happen. Not sure what's going on with that event engine account. Okay. So while we're waiting for this to, uh, to come on, um, there, there's uh, another advantage with, uh, with service catalog is uh, you, can, you can enforce tagging and you can make people choose tags and you can also enforce what those tags look like. So this again goes back to uh, in AWS, a lot of your cost exploration or tying together groups of resources back to a certain team. Maybe you've got a cost center or a chargeback uh, thing that you've got to do or you just want to know all of the different uh, individual resources that are going together for a particular project in an account um, or across many accounts. Uh, we have some great uh, marketplace partners like Aptio's Cloud Ability that can look across all AWS accounts and they can see those tags and then associate all those resources back to the costs and tie them back into things like reserved instances and spot instances. So when you're doing that, that cost management and just resource management in general, your tagging is very important. And with Service Catalog, you can enforce that on your users. That there's the classic, um, uh, you want the, the development, um, you know, what, what phase is it? QA testing, prod, right? And somebody types in lowercase prod, the next guy types in development, all one word. Uh, so you can really enforce what those tags look like ahead of time and that way that that helps you with your management overhead ah, ha, ha. this is going to be painful isn't it what is going on here i don't know what has happened to my <laughs> i just ran through this too man You know what? I'm gonna. All right. I'm sorry, guys. This is. I don't know if anyone else is following along with those uh, other accounts. If you want, if you're having the same issues. Yeah, I don't have anything in my product list. Okay, something is going on. This is the template name you are. I just did this right before, like not even an hour ago.
Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm not even going to try to figure this one out, but I switched over to Chrome. <laughs> and now I have my my three products and I'm back in the original event engine. So if you're, if you're following along here, I'm back in my event engine account. Um, so maybe, maybe try switching over to, uh, to Chrome for this. Let's see, uh, let's see how this goes. Um, I'm just going to uh, re-baseline ourselves. So anyways, we, we launched our portfolio. Everything was green. We're gonna head over to service catalog. This is what we should have seen the first time we came in. I didn't even change anything. I just switched browsers here. Nope, I wanted products from the top. Okay, now what we wanna do, we got three products in here. We've got an IDE uh, that just makes it easier to run through the lab. You can, um, everything you're doing here today, you could do within Visual Studio or VS Code, or um, I don't know if you, you like Vim or Nano, you can go as extreme as you want with all that. We're gonna go ahead and launch this uh, code pipeline product. So this is really our, our DevOps pipeline. Uh, and I'm gonna call this uh, my um, sample pipeline because I'm really original with my naming. Uh, and we're gonna be working through a Windows workload. So I'm gonna choose the Windows version of this pipeline here. There's also a Linux version if you wanna do that. Um, do a pretty similar lab with uh, Python. And I'm just going to make the Elastic Beanstalk the application name and the code commit repo name. I'm gonna make those the same just for simplicity here. Uh, here's where those tagging uh, tag options are. So if you've uh, put a tag option library out there and you wanted to enforce tags, right here's where you could do that, in which case you'd have a key and a value and it would force the user to do that. Uh, for this uh, example, we don't have that running. We can next through all that stuff and eventually get to a launch option here. And what we're doing, again, we're looking at this from the end user's perspective. So we've, we've created uh, quite a few different things. We've created a Git repo, which in AWS is called code commit. We've created a pipeline. So this is similar to uh, Jenkins or some GitLab stuff. There's a lot of different ways to, uh, to do these DevOps pipelines. In the AWS world, we're using that code star suite. So code pipeline is going to uh, take signals from code commit, which is our Git repo. And then it's going to kick off a pipeline, which will build our application and package it. And then it will deploy it to our Elastic Beanstalk application, which we'll create next. So we can see all of those in here. Uh, we got the, the Beanstalk application itself, and then we got the code pipeline project. Now, when you're kicking these off, you end up in kind of a chicken and an egg situation here. So uh, the way I usually do this is we get the, uh, the code pipeline, the project set up, uh, and then we're going to uh, check our code into it, at which point we will have a compiled app, and then we can go into Beanstalk, uh, the Beanstalk product, and we can launch that application. This is going to initially cause the code pipeline to fail because there's no application to update. So once we get all, both of those up and running, we'll make a change, we'll check it in, and then we'll see that that application gets updated automatically on Beanstalk when we do a check-in on master. So that's ultimately what we're doing here uh, with the DevOps. Uh, you would additionally uh, perhaps want to, if you've got your unit tests and stuff, you would want to alter some of these files to run your unit tests uh, because that's another big part of the DevOps thing. We want to find out about those, uh, those issues and bugs and errors and failed compiles. We want to find out about that before we release it to our end users, right? So I'm hoping here I've talked long enough. Our pipeline is now online. So we're going to go into that pipeline. So again, back to this uh, architecting with the end user in mind. When you're doing this, your end users may have limited access to the AWS console. So you really wanna to try to give them all the information they need to interact with these resources uh, through the CloudFormation template. Uh, and, and right here, we're looking at the outputs of that template. And so what we wanna do right now, we're, we're going to um, copy this, uh, this clone uh, HTTP address. We're gonna copy that because we're gonna use that in our IDE here. So now we're gonna go over to our, our Cloud9 IDE. We're gonna launch that. I'll call that my IDE. And this is gonna ask us some basic questions. 
Uh, you can give it a name. Uh, I always like to hibernate things. So one of the biggest things with cloud is you really should only be paying for what you're using when you're using it. So you want to go with the minimum instance and you want to shut these things down when you're not using them. So that's why we've got the hibernate in there. Um, and the other thing we've done here in service catalog via CloudFormation is I've restricted the instance types that you can use for this. Uh, now, a lot of people might even go a step further in what we call t-shirt sizing and just have small, medium, and large. And then they are determining what kind of instances the users can do. And this is really for, for those end users, they might not even know what a T2 is or a T3. Uh, and you want to just kind of do that for them. And then, uh, so down here is where we want to um, make a change though. So we're also going to automatically pull in our code commit repo into that IDE. So I had that URL, I'm going to paste it in both sections here. Uh, make sure you get rid of any uh, spaces. Um, but then this one, this repo path, this is where that repo will show up locally in the IDE environment. So we just want slash and then I just try to keep it simple, just keep the, the, name, of the, uh, the name of the repo there. So that will put this, uh, this bottom part, it'll put this get, this code commit repo into our IDE in this path. And we'll see that in just a second. So just paste those two uh, in there. And then we're going to next through all of this. And right now what we're doing, we're just setting up an environment. A lot of you would be using, um, uh, especially if you're in the .NET world, VS Code or Visual Studio. Uh, I have some instructions. We can talk about that later on how to create code commit user credentials. And then you can uh, put those into your Visual Studio and use that uh, with its Git compatibility. Uh, so that, that's probably the way most people are going to go. But I didn't want to rely on everybody having their IDE and, and setting that up. So this just makes it easier to, um, to run through the, uh, the exercises here. So now that is spinning up. While it's doing that, I'm gonna head over. We're gonna take off our end user hat and we're gonna be the admin for a second and we're gonna see what's going on behind the scenes here. So I'm gonna head over to CloudFormation which again, all of this is templates. It's all cloud formation. It's just service catalog is providing us a, a different in, in, um, input into that cloud formation, those, those templating worlds. And it holds those templates so that the end users can't mess with them. They really are immutable to your end users. Whereas if you're just handing out cloud formation templates, your users could potentially mess with those templates before launching them. Uh, so depending on how uh, secure you need your infrastructure environment to be, that might be important. Uh, but you can see on the back end what's going on. So I'm going to hit that cloud nine. I'm going to scroll down here. Any of the tags will be passed into all those products and all those resources. So again, say you've got a, a LAMP stack, you've got an RDS instance, an EC2 instance you would have all those tags automatically applied to all those resources. So you're really able to bind those together. Um, and right here, we just have the default ones that uh, service catalog will do. So going back, uh, this IDE should be available at this point. So we can head into there. And we've got our URL that we need to access the IDE. So we're going to open that up. And this will bring up cloud nine for us. And we're going to see it uh, pull down a couple uh, uh, repositories. I've got it set up. It's gonna do two things for us. It's gonna pull in that repo that we just did. So it's pulling in that, uh, that .NET app repo uh, that we just created in code commit. And then it's also pulling in the, uh, the reference architecture uh, uh, repo. So you have uh, all of those resources available as well. Uh, and of course this .NET repo is going to be empty because we haven't done anything yet. Uh, so if you're following along, I've got all these commands here. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we need a uh, we need a sample application. So I've prepared one. I'm going to find my chat window and I will paste that in there. Um, man, where's the where did my chat window go? Ah, 
There we go. Now we got the chat window. Oh, for the, I see this question now. Um, I, I, I deployed the launch stack button. Yeah. So here is a command. So we're going to actually, I'm just going to paste all the commands all at once and then we'll walk through them. Um, so this is everything we're going to need. And then you'll see me walk through that. So we're going to pull down an application. We're going to unzip it. We're going to move it into our repo and then we're going to check it in. That's, uh, that's all the stuff we're doing here. And again, I just went and, um, and grabbed the, uh, the sample application from Visual Studio. Uh, so this is just the, the Hello World uh, MVC C Sharp application. So then we're going to move everything over from there into our repo. Normally you would be checking your code in and then, yeah, now we're just into the, uh, the Git world. So we're going to go into our .NET app. And if you can't see what I'm doing, let me blow this up here. There we go. Okay. So we're in our .NET app in the directory there. We're going to go get status. Okay, we got a bunch of new stuff, so we're going to add that all in. Uh, and then we're going to go git commit hm first check in. And then we're going to push that up. Oop. Man, I'm getting... getting killed on the random stuff going on here. How does that not match? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Something really dangerous. Start this over again. Not sure why I'm running into all these issues here today. This is fantastic though. <laughs> Let's try this again. So if we're in here, ew, this is gonna be hard to do with that Zoom. Provision products, we wanna go back to our pipeline. I'm gonna grab this right here, go back to our, go get clone. Just force this to all happen again. Copy all of this. I'll just do it right within the uh, right within the IDE. Let's see in case we ran into some weird. Who knows? All right, we're the demo. The demo gods are against me today. <laughs> All right, so that should have been that easy. Just trying to copy some code in here and push it up to our code commit repo. <laughs> uh, so now we can go back over here into our uh, AWS environment, and we're going to head over to code commit. Nope, I'm in the wrong. If 
forgot I was doing this in Chrome. All right. Code commit. There's our repo. There's our stuff. So that got created when we created that first uh, product. So again, going back to this uh, uh, service catalog thing, you know, maybe you've got multiple projects in a single account. You can continue to reuse this pattern. It's there for anybody on that account that needs it. And we see this a lot with uh, customers. They might have separate accounts for separate environments. So maybe it's the same dev team, but they've got multiple accounts. Well, now they can just spin this up. They don't need to waste time going in and uh, creating all of these assets manually. They can just go right into service catalog and, and commit these things, get them up and running, which is ideally what we're trying to show today is how easy it is to get this up and running. So now we've got uh, code commit uh, running and this can take a little while to, um, to spin up this, uh, uh, this service, or sorry, the, uh, the Windows container that's doing the actual build. Um, but we can see the, uh, the pipeline, we go in here, the pipeline has already picked up on our new commit and now it's moving it through. So we're gonna build and then we're going to deploy. Now, this is very similar to how most other uh, pipeline uh, work, pipelines work. So if you go into this, yeah, oh, man, this is not gonna be, oh, of course not. I didn't even get all the stuff in there. The copy paste does not copy everything. That's going to fail the build too. That'll be good. I'm just going to do this one thing at a time. stuff going on here. Okay, those files, man, browsers are not working for me. So the files were already there. I don't know what's going on there. Okay, they did get checked in. <laughs> They're just not showing up when I, when I look for it. All right, back to this pipeline. We'll see what we're doing here. So what this is doing, it's just bringing up a container and then it's going to run those build spec files, which I was about to look at. So our, our Windows container is still spinning up here. So now what we can do is we can look at what's actually going on here. So we bring in this code pipeline here. And we've got two uh, stages. We've got a build and we got a deploy. So let's look at build. So build, this is pretty standard, just running, uh, running an update, and then we're gonna call uh, MS build. And then I just threw a directory list in there so we could see uh, what's, uh, what's going on uh, inside of that release package area. And then we're gonna move over, um, we need to move over two folders into the next stage. So that's what this, uh, this last command. So we want that object folder with the release package set up. And then we also want this code pipeline folder because that's got our other build spec, which is going to run on that deploy stage. So we need to make sure it's there for that uh, code build to, uh, to pick up. So then we look at that. Um, we just got, now we're, we're over into a, a Linux worker here. Uh, we're just going to, uh, again, just list that so we can just see uh, all of our pieces are there. And we're going to uh, copy our sample application over to, um, to S3. And then once it's in S3, it's going to create a version in Elastic Beanstalk and it's going to update that environment to that new version. Uh, and so th those are the stages we want to see happen. 
see if I talked long enough. This, uh, this can take a, a few minutes to uh, get up and running. So this is one of those dead spaces where we've, we've got just a little bit of time. If anyone has any uh, questions about where we're at, I can dive into something. Um, usually it takes about like three or 400 seconds to get that Windows uh, container up to do the build. And then once it does that, it'll just move through these, uh, these steps here. So if there's any questions, I can. Um... Hey, uh, uh, this is Elvis. I know the, the, the mm -hmm. talk is more focused towards uh, Elastic Beanstalk, but um, do you know how much customization do we get over that Cloud9 environment? Like, can we install additional tools and how much of that is available to us if we have a team that, you know, needs uh, uh, specific capabilities on that environment? That is a really good question. And unfortunately, I'm the wrong person to answer it. So I apologize. I, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I have not dived too deep into uh, Cloud9. I just use it as a, uh, as a basic uh, file editor here and, and then for the, uh, the console. So um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for you on that, how much you can customize it. No, it's fine. I, I was just asking because I, I have a specific problem right now and I had forgotten about Cloud9 mm. and it just like uh, uh, lit up as an idea, but it's perfectly yeah. fine. It does make it really easy. Uh, and that's what I'm doing here. It makes it really easy to interact with AWS resources directly because you can do instance profiles and you can wire up that security ahead of time, uh, which right. is what we're, we're doing right here with that code commit repo. Hey, and this is Zach. What I can do is any questions that are outstanding, if you guys sh share them with me at the end, I don't have an issue. I'll share them with the larger AWS community and team and see mm -hmm. if we can get some answers back out to the, to the meetup group. Yeah, so right now we're, we're still just kind of in a holding pattern on this. Uh provisioning that container there. Um, I can also show you the, uh, the cloud formation that's kind of binding all this together. So I saw a question earlier about that. Um, if we want to just go into this, uh, this uh, repo right here. So we have a lot of different sections. Uh, in general, they've got a quick little uh, video on how you can uh, do this. Most of these sections will have a launch stack button in them. The EC2 section in particular also has a tag option library built into it. So if you wanna try this out, you can just launch that stack. Uh, if you launch multiple stacks, it will ask you about a uh, um, create the end users. You can only do that once. So you'll have to select no on any, any stack after the first stack. Um, but you can launch that stack. It gives you a portfolio with uh, some EC2 instances in there, a Windows EC2 instance and a Linux EC2 instance, both of which have SSM maintenance windows. But then there's also a web server one with, uh, with Apache or Nginx pre-installed. So you can see how some of those uh, bootstrap scripts work within the, um, within the service catalog environment and really see how, you know, how quickly you could provide resources to your end users. So then they're doing the on-demand, hey, I need a new web server for something. Just go into service catalog, fire it up. It's already patched into the VPC, the availability zones. Again, all that good uh, security and logging and, and best practices are based, baked in there. Um, we also have in here, it's nearly the same thing as Elastic Beanstalk, but a uh, containerized version of this. So if you want to check in code, and have it run on a, um, a fully hosted uh, Fargate cluster with uh, ECS. So then the code will get validated, uh, built into ECR as a Docker container image. And then you can then launch the uh, service product, which will uh, run that, that code on a container on uh, Fargate. Uh, so very similar to what we're doing here with Beanstalk, but um, but on the uh, container side of things. 
And then in the container, we just got a couple pipelines. There's the .NET pipeline, there's the Linux pipeline, and then the, uh, the uh, actual Beanstalk application itself. And then these other ones, and you'll see this in every one of these sections, there's a portfolio and then products. The portfolio binds all of the products and the permissions, and it gives you a lot of that stuff that we see in service catalog. I'm going to hop over. Oh, good. Been talking long enough. It finally went through. Yeah, about 400 seconds. Excellent. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt myself and just show you. Okay, so now we see we've gone through here. Uh, we've called our uh, build... Uh, Oh, that's the update. And then we're doing the, um, the actual build right here. And then do, 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 it did all that successfully. And then it's moving over our files. So hopefully if we go back to our pipeline and we see a failure, which is what we would expect because we do not actually have a, um, we don't have a uh, Beanstalk application that's up and running yet, but now we have the pieces that we need. So we have taken and we've put our released package and we've uploaded that to S3. So now we're in a position to actually run the Beanstalk image. And this is uh, working out pretty well on the timing because we're getting to the end here. So what we wanna do is we wanna go to S3 And we want to go to service catalog. So now we go back to our products and service catalog, and we're going to use that final product, the Elastic Beanstalk application, and we're going to launch it. And I'm going to call this uh, my sample EB app. Okay, so now we need our S3. So now we got to point it, uh, and this is just the first setup. We got to get it up and running. So we need to point it at something. Um, so we're going to go in here and we're going to copy this bucket name, which should be a long stream of random stuff for you. So there's the bucket. And then we also want this, uh, this .NET one zip. So that's where the, uh, the actual file itself is located, the bundle. So we're going to put that in there. And then we're going to give it a name. Um, it's easiest just to give it that same name that we've been naming everything. If you want, there's some other, uh, there's some additional uh, uh, stuff you can do, like uh, 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 Elastic Beanstalk is going to give you a DNS prefix. Uh, so you can set that uh, yourself. Uh, I wouldn't do it right now because um, it, can, it can error out if you're not going unique and stuff like that. So we'll just leave that blank. And then you also have some control here out of the box on uh, the scaling, okay? So this is going to be a network-based scaling. And if, if the first instance reaches a certain threshold, then it's going to continue to bring on more instances to handle that volume up to four is what we're seeing here. So we're gonna have at least one, we'll have up to four. And then additionally, you need the solution stack name. So this one is set for Python, we're gonna delete that. If we go to this website right here, we can see all of the Beanstalk platforms that we uh, support. We're gonna go down because we're doing a .NET on Windows Server. And I'm just gonna grab this solution stack name right here, the Windows Server Core uh, 2019. And we're gonna go back to service catalog and I'm gonna paste that in there. Just double check our spacing on the end and the beginning. So you're just pasting that right in there. That's telling Elastic Beanstalk what framework we need. And then we're gonna hit next. Next, next, and launch. And now we are kicking off our actual application. So we can follow along with that if we want. If we go to CloudFormation, we can see what's going on in the background. Um, there's our template, it's being created. It will spawn another template as part of the Beanstalk uh, generation you can you can track this is also where you would go as an administrator to troubleshoot if there's uh, permission errors or something like that You're, you'll find them here and then once the beanstalk stuff uh, starts spinning up then we'll also uh, be able to follow along on the actual uh, beanstalk console itself so that'll take uh, that'll take just a minute or two um, i can turn it back over for q a if people want to ask questions, uh, probably a good time for the uh, Beanstalk people if um, uh, Taylor wants to um, talk about anything, uh, um, dive more into what's going on here. And I'll just, um, I'll just interrupt back in here. I'll leave the screen up 
and um, keep this checking. But what we're going to see is our Beanstalk application come online here. And if we have any time, what we can do also is go in here and we can, um, we, man, that interface is just not showing us everything. We can go in here. I just needed to refresh it. And we can make a change and then check that in. And at that point, it will do this because our Beanstalk application is in place. It will do the update and we'll see our change live on the internet here in a minute. Uh, so that, that's what we have left. If you're following along, uh, what you should, uh, what you can go and do. This environment, uh, if you're using one of the test environments, uh, you can, uh, or the burner accounts, you can, you can uh, play with that for a couple more hours uh, and we'll, we'll be shutting that down here later today. Thanks, Chris. So uh, yeah, Chris has uh, put in a lot of work here to create a variety of different uh, reference architectures within Service Catalog to automate the process of deploying to different uh, AWS um, compute platforms. Of course, uh, I think that's one for ECS uh, as well as EC2, and this particular one is for Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, one question folks may have about, you know, when would I want to use Elastic Beanstalk? Elastic Beanstalk as a service is designed to make it easy for you to host and scale web applications. Uh, it's really that simple. So the idea is that you just provide a source bundle, which in this case is, is being built using the pipeline, but um, you really just provide a source bundle in the form of a zip file. Uh, and then uh, again, if you're if you're going through this uh, pipeline or if you're just going directly to the Elastic Beanstalk console, uh, it's as easy as selecting an instance type. And then Elastic Beanstalk will return back a URL to you uh, uh, where you can navigate and, and uh, access your web application. Elastic Beanstalk supports a variety of different uh, runtimes. So uh, if you've developed your application in Node or Python uh, or .NET, uh, or Go, um, or Java, uh, or a variety of other different platforms, or runtimes. You can uh, just pick the corresponding platform with an Elastic Beanstalk uh, and run your application. So, uh, for example, if you're if you're new to the cloud and uh, you don't necessarily uh, want to go down the path of learning uh, a bunch of different services such as EC2 or load balancing or learning about auto scaling groups, you just want to get your application up and running quickly, uh, Elastic Beanstalk can be uh, one of the shortest paths uh, to, to getting that initial round of success in migrating to the cloud for your application. So that's just a brief summary of Elastic Beanstalk and certainly open any questions uh, around the service as well. Chris, how are we doing on the demo? Yeah, uh, the Elastic, oh, can you hear me? The, uh, the Elastic Beanstalk environment is uh, spinning up here. Um, and then as, uh, as Taylor was talking, you can see, you know, we just asked a couple questions in Service Catalog and it's creating a lot of stuff. And we've got security groups, we've got load balancers, we've got auto scaling configurations. So we're really, there's a lot of complexity in here. I really invite you to dive into these templates if you want to know everything that's going on. Uh, but that's really the power of something like Beanstalk combined with Service Catalog. You can provide these types of, of highly complex environments to your end users, and they need to know very little about what they're doing. Uh, and you can even uh, make this screen uh, even more simple. You know, if you know everybody's going to be using .NET, you can just hard code that uh, that value in there. So then your, your end users don't even need to know what that stuff is. So you, it gives you a lot of flexibility in what you're providing your end users uh, with some truly powerful um, compute going on. So I'm just uh, obsessively clicking refresh right now, but uh, we see a lot of this stuff is, uh, is spinning up, up and down. So we've got our CloudWatch events uh, going in here. So our, our scaling policy so again, there's a lot going on here to get this, uh, this set of uh, instances to load balance and scale automatically. And then, uh, oh yeah, and, and um, I was gonna show you all of these, uh, I was bringing that up. So we support a lot of these, uh, these platforms uh, natively with Elastic Beanstalk. So you can see all of those here. But 
that's pretty much it. Um, I think we're running up to the last few minutes. I don't know if we'll actually have time to see it spin up or not. If you're following along, hopefully, uh, oh, there we go. The cluster just created. So maybe right here at the end without me um, running into all those little hiccups along the way. Um, we can see what's going on here. So Chris, there's our, the URL. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was the other thing. Yeah. So let's, um, let's look at uh, this. So uh, we don't have an output yet because this hasn't uh, finished, um, but there is a uh, load balancer URL. This will get piped into service catalog eventually. Uh, so your end users would have that URL. And right now we're, um, we're still waiting for that environment. So it's uh, at this point, we can tell our load balancers are in place. We're routing correctly. We're onto the server instance, but we don't have the, uh, we don't have the application there yet. So uh, it's still, uh, it's still firing some stuff off here in the background. And we can see that probably right here. The, uh, yeah, the environment's still spinning up. So once all this completes, then we will have our uh, sample application here. Yep, and then uh, unfortunately we ran out of time. We won't be able to do a uh, an update unless people want to hang out afterwards. But that's the thing with this stuff. It sometimes it takes a, a minute or two for everything to uh, spin up and come online. So, any other questions from uh, from people? Uh, any questions about uh, Beanstalk or Service Catalog management tools in in general? Um, we can even dive into uh, some cloud formation if you want. Got a couple minutes. Ah, good. We got some winners on the uh, the tickets there from Justin. Hey, I'll ask a question. <clears throat> yeah, go for it. I'm Johnny Newman. Um, I am new to AWS. I'm trying to get uh, more experience in this area. Even looking at a, a, a position right now that um, I would I would be able to learn as I go. Um, and I look at everything that you're doing, and there's <laughs> there's an overwhelming amount of information here. So certainly, um, I guess my my question is, um, you know, where would you point somebody who's new for going through? you know, online tutorials and, and uh, any type of resources like that? Yeah, yeah, those, that good, great question. And, and we're, th there's definitely, there's so much uh, depth here with, with just what we're running here. Um, it depends on how you learn how I would answer that question. Uh, if, if you're a uh, start messing with stuff and breaking it, you know, ideally, uh, if, you're, if you're working for a company that has like a sandbox environment or something where, you know, they're, they're really uh, um, trying to breed that, that learning and, and uh, innovation spirit, uh, you would be able to uh, get in there, mess with some of these templates and try it out. I really highly recommend people start with the templating and just just get in from that uh, um, from the get go. That's where most enterprise companies want to be is on this infrastructure as code and templates. Uh, whether you're uh, well for any of them, any of the cloud providers in general, um, you can do a lot just in the console, and and that's a that's a good way to learn as well. Um, and seeing both at the same time maybe that's helpful. So we just generated this template and ran it, and then you can go into the console and you can see all of the pieces uh, that it put into place, you know, and, and for example, let me, to make things even more confusing, we can see what's going on in uh, EC2 here in the background. We've got some instances running for our IDE and Beanstalk, and we can go down here to our, uh, our load balancers. We can see all of the pieces that it put together. So this is a really good way to learn, you know, how did, uh, how did our template do this? What kind of listeners do you need? Um, so, so that's one thing. Um, the AWS samples in general, I really like that. Um, not just the reference architecture for service catalog, but AWS samples at large is really great. We're, we're constantly updating this stuff. This EKS workshop is fantastic, by the way. If you want to learn about Kubernetes on AWS, it'll walk you through a lot of the basics. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And then another thing I recommend is we have a lot of uh, certifications. So uh, maybe just going down the certification route, we've got uh, just the basic level one. I, I'm trying to remember what that's called, cloud, um, cloud something. Cloud um, yeah, thank you, cloud practitioner. And then work your way through the associate and the pro certifications. Um, that's a really good way to learn about a lot of different services along the way and get yourself a certificate. Uh, there's a lot of great partners out there like a cloud guru uh, who just bought Linux Academy. So if you, uh, again, if you've got the, the funds or your, com uh, your, your company is providing you that learning uh, funding, uh, you can get on there for a cloud guru and through Linux Academy, spin up these burner accounts, try things out, work through the labs. Uh, and then additionally, both of those are available through AWS Marketplace. So if, you're, if your company already has some uh, uh, spend with uh, AWS, then they can start to work on that uh, learning spend as well and, and bring that into their, uh, to their generalized uh, AWS monthly bill and spend. So there's a lot of options out there for uh, your company to help you learn and then yourself to learn. Okay, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. and and Johnny, I'd add one thing on this. In, in Chris, I think a cloud guru, guru is probably the best starting point. They have a bunch of different courses. It's that self-paced learning. Um, I actually think we just went through this with another customer. They have enterprise versions. And they also have individual versions. I think it's on a monthly um, as needed you know, basis where you can just throw your credit card information. I highly, highly recommend um, you, you pursuing that avenue. Okay, cool. I've got that one circled. Thank you. Yeah, and I, while we're talking, I'm just going to do this update so you can see. I don't know if you noticed in the background, but um, the uh, the web page did come online if you're still watching the screen. Uh, so we have that. And then the um, uh, the Beanstalk environment came online as well. So I'm just going to push out that update and we'll, we, we might still be around when it's uh, running. See the pipelines already picked it up. Um, <clears throat> this is, this is really, uh, you know, the, I, I think the goal of a lot of companies is to have these, these pipelines in place. And then, you know, you take it one step further and you just, you template the pipeline itself. And now you're really enabling that. And we've got some pretty high profile, uh, companies that have worked with us like GoDaddy, for example, they did a big uh, presentation with our work. Uh, we did, uh, again, service catalog, DevOps, there's serverless in there, Beanstalk, and just enabling their their entire development organization, like not just a single team, but, you know, thousands of teams uh, to to get this stuff and just really easily spin up an account and have all the tools they need to start coding. Um, and that, that's where you're getting if you, if you just go down that templating route initially. Um, I recommend that for companies and for uh, individuals. Uh, you know, that, that's going to put you in the strongest position for the, the skill set and then where, where companies want to be. So great. I think we, we hit the, the timer. Any other questions or I'll turn it back to the, um, to the meetup folks. Chris, uh, Sergey speaking. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Um, it's about, you know, the elastic bin stock itself. Uh, I was trying to like, uh, follow what you were doing and I missed that initial part. And actually it was just an example how to like get something like, you know, all this, uh, it was not actually like subject of a conversation. It was some kind of pre-requested to like do this uh, nice elastic beanstalk stuff. So it's like, it was an example. But mm -hmm. okay, I just uh, went ahead and just uh, created a simple application and a beanstalk. And I just pick it like example, like Glassfish app. And uh, it just, yeah, it created like a, uh, it uses CloudFormation stack to create you know, easy to instance, you know, load the app, you know, everything cool. The question is, okay, I have an application and uh, I just can deploy it, yes. But uh, what about like all these little parameters 
for example, some kind of like credentials, uh, all the things, and especially if you have like an application and uh, it is built and like, you know, uh, tested in one environment and then you need to take it to another environment. And uh, for example, we use uh, Amazon uh, parameter store for that. Mm -hmm to provide all these uh, little things like login passwords, you know, all this uh, at application start. But uh, it requires some kind of customized it like startup scripts, you know, all the things. And uh, how is all this uh, been installed? So for example, I can save a lot of time just uh, not creating all this, uh, you know, uh, cloud formation uh, templates and just use the Beanstalk, but uh, is that Beanstalk that customizable, that convenient to not just like Hello World, deploy Hello World application, but something like more like r close to real life, like when, hey, we need to change this parameter or just uh, something like that. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm going to say two things real fast, and then I'll turn it over to the uh, Elastic Beanstalk folks. Um, so I would say on the first part, uh, the templating is actually going to be easier for you if you, uh, uh, even on the SSM parameters, if you can template those, you can move them around between accounts much easier. Uh, you can, in fact, you can use uh, CloudFormation stack sets, and then you can blast out the exact same template to all your environments. And that's where a lot of companies want to be, where uh, when you move from dev to prod, there's probably a wall there that you want where prod should match dev. And the best way to do that is to lock down your prod environment so that only infrastructure templates can be used to spin those resources up. And that way, you know, it's matching the best. And then that transition is just even easier to do. So that goes back to, again, the, the templating, the infrastructure as code and the automation. Um, you know, there's an initial hump to get it set up. But then in the long run, you're saving so much more time uh, not needing to click around in the console. And, and the worst case scenario would be to click around in the console and you've got like a checklist in front of you and to, and to miss one of those steps. Well, the, the templates are going to be the same every time. Uh, so that, that would be my comment on, on how to make that easier. Uh, I'll let, I'll let uh, Taylor talk about uh, Beanstalk. Unless we lost Taylor. Hey, this is Shaker. Uh, I can take that. Oh question. yeah, yeah, go for it. Yep. Hey, yeah. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Beanstalk provides uh, environment variable support, so customers can add environment variables in the configuration page. Uh, but other than that, if customers are using something like SSM Parameter Store or Secrets Manager, um, you can use um, the EB extensions way or you can pass the parameter store on in the application code. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, so very simple variables you can easily go and add in the uh, in environment variables. Uh, Chris, if you are looking at it, you, you could uh, go to configuration. Right here. And yeah, you can search for environment variables there in the search box. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's much it was, easier. I don't think I set any, so we're not going to see them here on this particular one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's none oh, set in here. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, that, that's uh, like if you had uh, using SSM parameter store, uh, the two easy ways to do that is you could write an EB extension script um, and put it along with your application code, or you can instrument your code such way that it references parameter store all. Yeah, and no, I, I see people doing um, a combination of both. You know, you some mm -hmm. of your parameters you're going to template and hard code, and then others you need in that protected uh, SSM space. So then you would just be doing a, a, a CLI call or a command call um, to uh, the AWS to to grab that information. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if um, how much uh, further over time we want to go here, but I think this pipeline might be. Yeah, it's still running. It well, my my calendar is clear. If you want to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's not much to see other than uh, while while people were talking, I went and edited our uh, the uh, the HTML page. So at some point, this will this will run through and update that application and then we can, uh, we can see it in here. Yep. Hey, uh, Wendy Rodriguez, if you want to PM me your email address, you're one of the Uber eats winners. Sorry, Chris. Oh no, you're fine. I'm, I'm pretty much done. So unless there's any other questions or anything, um, uh, we we're that that's it. Any more questions? Any more feedback for Chris or is there anything for the AWS team that's still here? Awesome. All right. Well, Chris, I think Taylor already left and Sekhar, thank you guys very much for, for jumping in and doing this presentation for us and for everybody, everybody that joined us today, uh, another, another great turnout.